take your Bible and turn to Genesis. That shouldn't take you long to find, I hope. If it does, we need to spend more time together individually, I think. Genesis chapter 3. We could do, I thought about this, but we could do another series through Genesis. We've done that. Brother Chris did one not long ago, or at least did part of it, did Life of Joseph. But um, we're not going to attempt that tonight. Genesis chapter 3, and to begin with, I just want to look at two verses. We're going to uh, press on from there and, and look at some other things as we go. But just two verses to begin with. Genesis chapter 3 and verses 14 and 15. Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15. It says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Notice that last part of verse 15. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we have this opportunity to gather together. Thank you for those who are here and for those who may be listening. And Lord, bless and use us this evening. Give us fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. Give us spirit-filled listening. Guide us by that same spirit into all truth. And Lord, we want to hear from you tonight. We want to learn from you tonight. We want to be strengthened by you tonight. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 3, we have the story of the fall of mankind. Now, you know the story. We're not going to go through all of it. Uh, but mankind was created in the image of God. There's no doubt about that. And chapter 1 says, So God created man his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. But the image of God died within Adam when he willfully chose to disobey God and introduce sin into the world. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man, meaning Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Somebody says, Well, I, I don't think it's right. I ought to have to die for Adam's sin. Well, you have your own, so, so don't worry about uh, Adam's sin. You have your own to take care of. Now, no doubt somebody, maybe nobody in the room tonight, but somebody would think, Preacher, you don't really believe that, do you? And yes, I do. And if you don't believe that, perhaps you have a better explanation of the corruption of mankind and the results of wickedness that we've seen down through history and that seems to be getting worse and worse as time goes on. Do you have a better reason for that to happen? than the fact that man is corrupt and has not the image of God in him, is created in the image of God, but has not the image of God until he is born again. And then once again, we have the image of God in us. But our creator did not leave us in that state of being lost and separated from him, even though it's our own actions that have caused us to be lost and separated. In Genesis chapter 3, we have what C.I. Schofield called the highway of the seed, or the beginning of it. Genesis is the book of beginning. The word Genesis means beginning. So let's take a look at what the Bible says about the highway of the seed, or the promise of the Redeemer. Look again, if you will, at, at Genesis 3.14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent. Now the serpent represents Satan. Say, do you think it was a real serpent? I do. Well, that, see, that just shows how silly you are. Uh, you think a serpent could talk. Let me share something with you. If God created the entire universe, and I believe he did, and if he spoke it all into existence, if he chose to create a serpent that could talk, he could do that. But I think there's more to it than this. I think this might have been an ordinary serpent. I think this serpent, it appears, was possessed by Satan himself and is not the 
physical creature that's speaking. It's Satan who's speaking. I think that's obvious from the text. But there's a curse that God puts upon the serpent. In verse 14, it says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go. Some people think that phrase means that the serpent originally had legs. Now, I, I don't know that that's true, but some people think so. And dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now, in verse 15, we have the promise of the Redeemer. The Lord goes on, still addressing the serpent. He says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman. I think it's fair to say that most women don't like serpents. Some do. Some, some like them. They like to handle them. They'll have them as pets or do other things. But, but most women don't like serpents. Now, I I'm, I'm, don't consider myself a woman. I hope you're okay with that. But um, I don't like serpents either. I, I just They're not my favorite creature by a long shot. Uh, I've come to learn more about them. I used to be, when I was a young child, I was afraid of any kind of snake. It didn't matter what it was, I was, it was a snake. As I've gotten older, I realize that most snakes are harmless. Uh, they, they don't, if they eat anything, it's a bug, but uh, they, most of them don't bother you at all. As a matter of fact, there are only four poisonous snakes in this area where we live. Some people would argue three, but I'm going to say it's four. They are the diamondback rattlesnake and the pygmy rattlesnake. And that's where some people disagree and say it's three, that they're both rattlesnakes. Well, they are, but there's a difference in the diamondback and the pygmy. Where you're sitting on this property, I have never seen a diamondback rattlesnake and I've never seen a pygmy rattlesnake on this property. So you don't have to worry about those around here. When you get out in the Everglades, you might come across them, but, but I've never seen one here. Did see a raccoon here not long ago. Uh, it's just probably two weeks ago out at the dumpster there. He was, it was kind of interesting. The, the fella came to empty the dumpster and uh, he got out of his truck, opened the doors and he opened the lid of the dumpster and the raccoon jumped out and that was entertaining to watch. But I um, uh, have seen that, but haven't ever seen a rattlesnake on this property. The, then the third snake would be the water moxin or cotton mouth. Now, I've never seen one of those here either. I have seen them, but not on this property. I, out west here, uh, so the well, all of this area used to not be built up and developed as it is, but west of Military Trail there and just north of Atlantic Avenue used to be kind of wilderness. And In the old days, we'd take teenagers out there for a night hike, and we had a couple of members who lived out there, but they didn't have very many neighbors. And uh, it was an interesting place. I went out there to scout out a, a night hike go out in the daytime and there was a little pond there and somebody built a little dock on the pond and I noticed laying on top of that dock there was a, a big cottonmouth snake. I didn't see exactly how long he was because he was coiled but he was about that big around. I could saw that and I decided to keep my distance. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to get close to him or bother with him. Uh, but I've never seen one of those on this property, and you probably won't. They, they generally stay close to the water. And then there's the coral snake. Now, the coral snake is a very beautiful snake. It's banded in, in uh, different colors, red and uh, yellow, killifella, red and black, friend of jack. That's how you tell the coral snake from the king snake that looks very similar. King snake doesn't, is harmless. I've seen here uh, many glass snakes, which people say is not technically a snake, it's really a legless lizard, but it looks like a snake. I've seen many black snakes here. Uh, they eat things that you don't want to be here, so that they're not bad. And then there's red rat snakes and others that we've seen here, not many. I haven't seen any in, in, in pretty good while. But have seen, and not recently, coral snakes here. This is December, and I'm going to take a minute to tell you this story. Those of you who've been here for years have heard this. But um, one December, I had been up uh, in West Palm Beach for something. I don't remember what it was. And I came back here. It was about 4.30 in the afternoon, and um, we had a big Christmas tree back in that corner there. We used to have one that was reached up to the soffit level there, at least maybe higher. 
and um, had a big Christmas tree back in the corner there. We were all decorated for Christmas. And at 4.30, it was beginning to get dark. It wasn't quite dark yet, but it was beginning to get that way. And I came in, and I saw something right down here in the center aisle, and I thought, what is that? And whatever it was was moving. And I got closer to it, and I saw there was a coral snake right down here. And uh, it was, uh, I'm going to say he, I don't know if it's he or she or how you tell, but it was making its way up the aisle here. And I suppose it was coming to repent. But, uh, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, make its way up the aisle. And I thought, well, that's not good to have a poisonous snake in the church. Better get that and get it out. So I went out the shed there to get a shovel and uh, take care of Mr. Coral Snake. And when I came back, I couldn't find him. I thought, this isn't good. You know, I, I had all kinds of thoughts went through my mind. I thought about what if that thing gets in the nursery and we don't find it and it bites a little child, that would be horrible. Or, or we had the choir then, I could just imagine us having church and all of a sudden one of the ladies just falls over and, you know, got bit by the snake. And, uh, you know, none of that happened. I just imagined that, you understand. But I turned on every light in the place. And I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I cannot find this coral snake. It's in here somewhere. So I, I can't let it stay in here. So I'm looking all over for it. And I called Palm Beach County Animal Control, and you know what they said? They said, we don't deal with snakes. I thought, well, you're a lot of help. And they gave me a phone number. They said, call this number. This fella handles them. He'll, he'll take care of it. Well, I called the number, and I got a voice message. That wasn't much help either. Don't know when he's going to get the message, or if ever, and I need somebody now. So I called Delray Beach Police Department. You called police on a snake? I sure did. And they came out. Two officers came out. Thank God for them. And they helped me search. They're searching all over. We're looking in the back hallway. We're looking everywhere. Can't find this snake. And all of a sudden, one of the officers says, I got him. And the snake was a crawling up into the Christmas tree. And I thought, boy, he gets up in there, we're in, we're in trouble. So the officer pulled out a collapsible baton that he has, and when it's collapsed, it's about like that and expands out to be about like that. You know what they call that? They call that an asp. How appropriate is that? <laughs> okay. They call he clicked that thing out and trapped Mr. Coral Snake. And then he said, have you got... Uh, any work gloves? I said, yes. He said, get them for me. I came and went and got them, brought them back. He said, put one on this hand. I put it on his hand. He switched hands, put one on this hand. And with the work gloves, he just reached out and grabbed him. He took him out. Okay. <laughs> and I would have killed it. I, I'll be honest with you. I'll just tell you the truth. I would have killed it. But he didn't. He took it out and, and released it uh, outside and let it go. Now, everybody now is going to be looking under the pews and thinking, <laughs> what's, what's in here? But uh, that's, that was my Christmas coral snake story. That serpent didn't hurt anybody that day. But the one in Genesis 3 did. Revelation 12, 4 says, And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Later on in that chapter, it says the dragon, which is that old serpent and the devil and Satan, And so God addresses Satan. Satan's desire was to prevent the Savior from coming into this world. He failed in that goal. So his next goal is then to come and keep this world from coming to the Savior. Now think about that. He couldn't keep the Savior from coming to the world, but he's trying to keep the world from coming to the Savior. So God puts an enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Look at that, verse 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. So the, descendant of the descendants of the serpent and the descendant of the woman. Now that's very precisely worded. This is the seed of the woman and not of the man. I quoted to you a while ago, Romans 5, 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so 
death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. The sin nature is passed down through the father. The seed of the woman, the one born of a virgin, did not inherit the sin nature. And look what else we see in verse 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It, the seed of the woman, shall bruise thy head. That's a death blow. Thou shalt bruise his heel. It's obvious that when Jesus was crucified and they drove that spike nail through his ankles, uh, we've seen the ankle bones of a man, not Jesus' bones, a man named Yohanan or John, and, and this wouldn't be any of the Johns you read about in the New Testament. But the spike goes in and separates the bones of the ankle and goes through to nail into the cross so that none of the bones are broken. You have complex bones in your ankle and it can go through without breaking those bones. The Romans were experts in crucifixion they perfected the art somebody said they didn't invent it I, i'm not sure that's true but i've heard that but they became experts as a matter of fact those who carried out crucifixion that was their whole job that was their well, i should say that was their primary job they were soldiers they had to do other things of course but that was their primary job they had their own quarters they had their own diet and that was their job to carry out crucifixion and they had it down to a science they knew where to place the nails, how to place them. They had it down to a science. So the serpent would bruise the heel of the woman, a, a wound to be sure, but not a death blow. The, the, I'm sorry, of the woman of the seed of the woman. The nail of the cross would penetrate the heel, bruise the heel, but not break a bone. Not a bone of him should be broken. But the seed of the woman would give the death blow to the serpent. Now I'm going to ask you to turn, if you will, over Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. And so much more we could read, but let's read Genesis chapter 6 beginning at verse 18. Genesis 6 and verse 18 says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, and when you read in the Bible that somebody's a just man, it means a righteous man. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God, as did his ancestor uh, Enoch. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and thou shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And we could say a great deal about the uh, ark and how it was constructed and so forth. So it's a great study all by itself. But Noah has three sons, we're told, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Each of Noah's sons became the father of a major segment of the human race. Long after the flood, when they began to repopulate the earth, Ham goes south, and he goes into the continent of Africa. Japheth goes north to the continent of Europe. Shem stayed in what we call the Middle East, and then his people also traveled into what we call the Far East. And that's the beginning of the population of the earth. So this is a very special verse. And in this verse, in this passage, there is a blessing upon Shem. Look at chapter 9, Genesis chapter 9, and look at verse 26, Genesis 9 and verse 26. And he, this is Noah speaking, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So Shem has a special blessing placed upon him. Now why is that? Well, let's go to chapter 12. 
many, many people, many families are descended from Shem, but we're going to look at one man's family. Genesis chapter 12. As many generations passed, here's a descendant of Shem, verse 1. Now the Lord had, play, had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So much there. This is what we call the Abrahamic covenant. Abram is called to leave Ur of the Chaldees. I was right over there one afternoon years ago. And uh, our second oldest son, Michael, called me. And I was very surprised to get, him, to get a call from him because he wasn't in the country at the time. And he called me, and I was, I was right over there, answered the phone, and he said, Dad, said, you'll never guess where I am. I didn't know where he was. I said, where are you? He says, I'm at Ur of the Chaldees. He says, I'm standing here looking at it as I'm talking to you. I said, wow, that is so cool. Now, what took him there wasn't so cool, but it was cool that he got to see it. This is the place where Abraham lived and where he was called to leave. Some people think that, that um, there's a ziggurat at Ur today. Uh, that is a pyramid of sorts. It doesn't slope up like the Egyptian pyramids. It's a step pyramid, similar to the ones you'd see in South America. Some people think that that is the Tower of Babel. Now, is it actually? Well, I don't know. It might be. It's old enough to be, but I don't really know if it is or isn't. It could be in about the right location. But Abraham's called to leave this place. And where is he going? Well, look at verse 1 again. The Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Leave home, Abram. Where are we going? I'll tell you later. And so Abram goes. And, and Sarah, you got to give her credit. She went with him. Where are you going, Abram? I'm following God. Well, where, where's God leading you? I don't know. They went anyway. So the promise in verse 2 is that he would be the father of a great nation. I will make of thee a great nation. Now his name is changed from Abraham, uh, Abram to Abraham, which means the father of nation. In verse 3, I will bless them that bless thee. It would be great if people in the world today and people in America today would remember verse 3. God promised to the seed of Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Through the seed of Abraham, all families of the earth are blessed. Let's go to chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. Chapter 17 and verse 19. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him. What covenant? The covenant that he made originally with Abram. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and, watch it, with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac. So uh, Ishmael is the son of Abraham, and he has many children, becomes a father of nations, but he is not heir of the covenant. It's important to see that. My covenant, which I, will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. So Abraham follows God, Sarah is surrendered, and the covenant that God makes with Abraham, he passes on to Isaac and through Isaac. Go to chapter 28, Genesis chapter 28. Genesis 28. And we want to look at verse 10. 
Genesis 28, verse 10. It says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed a dream, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And the Lord, behold, the Lord stood above him and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest. To thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. In thee and in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. There's that phrase again. Everybody in the world will be blessed through the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And by the way, Notice something else here. It says that the seed of Jacob was spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, the south. There is not a continent on the planet where you do not find descendants of Jacob. God said it would be that way. Verse 15. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. And I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. God's keeping his promise. He keeps all of his promises to us, whether we like it or not. He keeps all his promises. We can say more about that. We don't have time. Go to chapter 49, Genesis 49. We looked at this not long ago when Brother Chris taught on the life of Joseph. But I want to point just one thing out to you. Genesis chapter 49 and verse 8. This is Jacob at the end of his life. They're in Egypt. And Jacob is giving a final blessing to each of his sons. Now look in verse 49 and verse 8. Jacob is talking to his sons, giving a blessing to each one of the twelve. But he says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. And that's interesting. The other tribes will bow down before the tribe of Judah. Verse 9, Judah is a lion's whelp. The symbol, each tribe had a symbol. The symbol of the tribe of Judah is a lion. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. And he stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Now verse 10, watch it very carefully. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. The scepter, that which a king would hold. Uh, when he's giving the laws of the land. So there would always be a king from the tribe of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. The one who gives the law. Well, didn't Moses give the law? Yes, Moses writes this and records this for us, but it's not talking about Moses. Moses wasn't of the tribe of Judah. Moses was of the tribe of Levi. So he's not talking about Moses. A scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Now, Shiloh is a very, very important word. Jacob has 12 sons, gives blessings to all of them, but this is peculiar to Judah. A scepter will not depart from him. A descendant of Judah will be a king, a lawgiver, a righteous one, until Shiloh come. The word Shiloh means tranquility and rest or peace. Now, notice this. This is a ruler. He has the scepter. He's a lawgiver. And Shiloh comes who is tranquility and rest, but he's royal of the royal line, 
This is the Prince of Peace. Do you see that? Very clear. Until the Shiloh, or the Prince of Peace, come, unto him shall the gathering of the people be. They're all going to gather, all going to gather to this descendant of Judah. Now we're going to turn way over to 1 Samuel chapter 16, and don't worry, we're just about finished here. 1 Samuel chapter 16. First Samuel chapter 16, we're just going to look at one verse, a very important verse. First Samuel chapter 16 and verse 13. First Samuel 16 and verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So Samuel anoints David. David is not yet king. David doesn't know he's going to be king at this point. Samuel knows it. Samuel understands that. God told him. And Samuel is anointing David to be king. But more importantly, that phrase, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward, from that day on. David had the Spirit of the Lord. Now, did David live a perfect life? He did not. But we understand that in that day, and if, if we could read farther and we don't have time for it, we'd find the Spirit of the Lord left King Saul, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. Now, here's the situation. In those days, prior to the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon people and left people. After Pentecost, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But it says of David, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. After David's great sin in Psalm 51, David prays, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He was afraid the Lord would take away the Holy Spirit from him. But he didn't. He could have. But he didn't. The Spirit of the Lord was on David from that day forward. One more passage and we're finished tonight. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. And go to verse 12. 2 Samuel 7 and verse 12. It says, and when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee. This is the Lord speaking to David. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, David had a son, and after, he had a number of sons, but we know of Solomon. After David's death, Solomon builds a house for the Lord. It was the first temple. Uh, they did not have a temple prior to that. They worshiped at the tabernacle, not the temple. But this isn't just talking about Solomon. How do you know? Well, look at verse 13 again. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Did Solomon's kingdom last forever? It didn't. It didn't. But there's a son, a seed of David, whose kingdom shall last forever. Verse 14. And I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. Now, the Lord is telling David something here. Watch 16, and we're, we're finished. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thy throne, uh, before thee, and thy throne shall be established forever. So God makes a covenant with David. A son of David will build a house for the Lord. The throne of David will last forever. 
this is not just talking about Solomon. Solomon built a house, he had a throne, but his kingdom did not last forever. This is talking about a king who will sit and rule from Jerusalem on the throne of David forever. Again, that's not Solomon, but Solomon, by the way, is, is a type or a picture. The Solomon's name actually means Prince of Peace also. I, I like it in English much better. In English, we say Solomon. In Hebrew, it's Shlomo. I'd rather be called Solomon than Shlomo, just to tell you the truth, but that's, that's how it is. So God's love for mankind was revealed in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is no more. Uh, they say that it, you can find the remnants of it in, in Iraq. Is that true? I don't know. I've heard that. I don't know that to be fact. But whether that's true or not, the bar Garden of Eden would have been obliterated in Noah's, Noah's flood. I wouldn't expect to find it. But God's love in the Garden of Eden knows no end. So the fact that the lineage of the seed of the woman, the one called Shiloh, the one who was the descendant of Noah and descendant of Abraham and descendant of Isaac and descendant of jo um, Jacob, this son of David is going to come and reign. Now the prophecies were given, and, and we've only gotten through about the first thousand years of them, but the prophecies were given over a period of four thousand years before Jesus came but this is one of the great proofs that the Bible is true the story is real Jesus of Nazareth is without doubt the Savior of mankind and what he asks for us from us is our faith so it comes down to John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son born of a virgin his only begotten son. Don't, don't let them take that word begotten out. Some of the newer English versions leave out the word begotten. And they say God so loved the world he gave his one and only son. That's technically not true and it's doctrinally not true. John 1.12 says as many as received him to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. We are children of God by adoption. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Huge difference. Huge difference. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son of God that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's why Jesus came. So we have this highway of the seed, and we haven't finished it. Lord willing, next Sunday night we'll, we'll finish it up. But we see all the way through this first thousand years, the prophecies given and renewed again and again, and they get more precise as to the one who would come, Shiloh, the Prince of Peace, the descendant of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all uh, the descendant of Noah prior to that and the descendant of Judah of the tribe of Judah and a descendant of David this shows us how God told people for 4,000 years in advance that the Savior was coming let's pray Father thank you so much for blessing us thank you that we have this time together and Lord I just pray that you would help us this night to realize how we have a trustworthy Bible to realize how we have a trustworthy God to realize how we have a trustworthy Savior who is like none other and Lord what you ask for us from us is our faith to believe in you to trust you Lord strengthen our faith we pray Lord if there's a soul listening tonight who doesn't know you as Savior may they come to place their faith and trust in you Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. But for those of us who do know you, may our faith be strengthened. And may we grow in that same faith. Now, Lord, work in our hearts, we pray, as we come to an invitation time. In Jesus' name, amen.